Jai Guru, everyone. Jai Guru. Welcome to this next episode of our podcast, uh, Minute by Minute of the movie Awake, the Life of Yogananda. We have reached minute number 55. Um, today we are going to be talking a little bit about Guruji turning his community into more of a monastery and the community members turning more into monastics. And then we have Herb Jeffries, who is an actor. Um, he was a big shot at the time and who spent a lot of time with Guruji um, during his time when he was at Lake Shrine. And so it's going to be interesting. But first, um, let's talk. Uh, let's say hi to the guys. How is Priyank? Priyank's very good. Thank you. Excellent. And Chris, how are you doing in Brazil? Very well. Thank you very well. It's uh, it's winter here in Brazil, so um, it looks like know, it. Yeah, totally. It's, uh, it's a week, a week, fifteen, eighteen degrees. You know, struggling. But no, all, uh, all, all's well. All's well. Thank you. It's uh, it's good to get to this minute. It's it's nice this minute actually. Um, uh, I, I really enjoyed Herb's um, uh, impression of Guruji. Uh, <laughs> I remember when, when I first watched it, I, th I thought <laughs> it was pretty, pretty, pretty close um, in some way. In some way. Um, he, you know, he got the inflections right, at least. So, uh, yeah, it should be a fun minute. Sounds good. Sounds good. So let's start out with um, some words from Phil Goldberg. He talks about the rebuilding of uh, Guruji's um, organization after Dhirananda left the ashram. And I'm going to read a little paragraph from there. He says, this was a watershed moment in Yogananda's life and work as Mount Washington began a gradual transformation from community to monastery. A renunciate order clearly suited both Yogananda's personal predilections and his organizational goals. As a guru, he coveted disciples who were passionately committed to spiritual unfoldment as the leader of a growing and ambitious organization, he decided um, he dedicated helpers who shared his vision and could focus on the work with as few distractions as possible. The subsequent history of Yogananda's accomplishments was marked by the decision to place vital responsibilities in the hands of monastics and to empower female monastics to an unprecedented degree. And we talked about this last time already a little bit that he um, passed out a lot more responsibilities to his lay members and now they became disciples. And the actual watershed moment that Phil Goldberg is talking here about is actually Dayamata um, and her family joining the ashram, which, which um, they were all really good um, uh, organizers. They were all very good at um, doing the ashram work and they were able to take a lot of burdens off Yogananda's shoulders and put them, um, do them themselves. And it freed up uh, Guruji's time a lot more. So there was a lot more delegation going on and there was a lot more um, uh, organization happening. So the organization grew in a different way this time. It was less in a, um, sensationalist way and it was more in uh, very devout followers came and it grew slowly but organically. Priyank? Yes, I was wondering who the first monastic was. Mm. Do you think you know? <clears throat> no, I don't think I know. It'll be interesting, I don't know, I'm just looking at that Wikipedia page that we talked about last time which is like the list of direct disciples of Yogananda which says like for example, the first one on the list is like Dr. Lewis is in 1920. Then mm -hmm. it says Sister Yoga Mata in 1920. But that doesn't that doesn't say like when she took her vows. Um, um, you know, it doesn't say when she became a monastic. So it's a bit. Um, I wonder who the first actual Western one was that took the vows. If anyone knows, please do let us know. It's um. I I would say the. The dates are, it's, it's not easy to know at what point it actually became a monastic order 
or if it was one from the beginning. And I'm not even sure if Dr. Lewis was ever a monastic. No, Dr. I, Lewis wasn't. No, no. But I'm yeah. talking about the actual, well, the monastic order in the sense that the first person that actually chose to renunciate their, you know, uh -huh. their, their lives and dedicate their lives to, to Guruji and living with him, etc. Chris, what you were saying something? I, I had the impression that there was a few at the same time in the last minute. Um, the, the, the impression that I got um, was that there was a, an influx, you know, several kind of came on at one time. I got that impression, but could be wrong. Um, yeah. Which, uh, yeah, we, we'd like to, to know more then. Mike, why don't you take the monastic vows? I thought about this. Oh, did you? I thought I was just oh. winding you up. Go on. Yeah. Revelations. Yeah. Um, but no, it's, it's been some years ago, but I I decided that this is not the path for me in this life. Um, but it's I the the more I the, the older I get, the more I see the wisdom in the in the monastic path. Because it it really gives you gives you all the things you need because at, at the end of the day what you want is you want to um like go beyond your ego and you want to live a life for god and that's definitely one amazing way to do it mm. um this there I, is yeah chris sorry can i jump in i actually found um some information on yogananda site.wordpress.com um it says that in fact, the first disciple of the SRF monastic order to whom he gave the Swami vows was a woman, Sri Dayamata, who later served as the spiritual head as SRF. That's what it says. Hmm. Okay, this... that, make, that makes sense. But it's, that would also mean that the, the monastic life really started in the 30s, right? Yeah. Not, not at the beginning, yeah. which is what we thought anyways, right? I think that was the impression. Well, that, that was the impression I got from this documentary that there was some turmoil. He came back, he started from the ground up, and then actually he had his he had um, people come forward to be to be monks, uh, to go to the monastic order. That was the impression I got. That's that's yeah. also the impression I have that there were always a lot of people surrounding Guruji when he was in America, and there were also a lot of people um, in the early days at Mount Washington. But after the uh, after Dhirananda left, the I think the numbers they 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 were different. They they were maybe less people, but the quality was also different. There were like really sincere God seekers going there, and and they and th so they were really people who were um, ready for a real monastic ashram life. I don't think that was the case before. That's at least the impression I have. If anyone has any other ideas, correct me. Um, the, me. What, one thing they they also mention in the, in the film is the the vows of the ashram life, and there's four qu qualities that they mention: simplicity, celibacy, obedience, and loyalty. And that to me sounds like <clears throat> very like a very simplistic lifestyle, um, and that's kind of also the vibe that I get from from SRF. I feel like the monks that I met, they kind of represent all of those values beautifully. They, I, I was going to say especially one of them, but actually they, they represent all of them in a, in, a, in a beautiful way. All right, let's move to the um, person that takes up most of that minute. And that is the actor, Herb Jeffries. Um, what we know about him is he, he was born in 1913 in Detroit. His original name was Umberto Alexander Valentino, which sounds a bit Italianish. So I'm guessing he had like Italian in his blood. Um, he was a, a famous actor at the time. He was also a jazz singer. He was playing in, in um, Western movies, um, none of which I know because they were all from the 30s, but there's like um, Harlem on the Prairie, Bronze Buckaroo, and he was known as the singing cowboy because he played those cowboy roles and he was also singing in those movies. Um, he lived a, a long life. He, he, he lived until 2014, so he, he got 100 years old. 
And he met Guruji frequently in his time in um, uh, at Lake Shrine. Um, that must have been in the 1940s, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. After they acquired Lake Shrine, Guruji spent a lot of time there. And um, so he has this uh, uh, story where he says when he first came to Lake Shrine, he and he must have also been talking about Mount Washington because he was talking about a hill where he can go to. He's, he um, had this um, uh, story. I'm, I'm going to read the dialogue a little bit where he, he keeps saying basically that whenever he saw religion before, he it was a lot of things that he was not allowed to do. He shall not do that. He shall not do this. And then he went, one of the first times he met Guruji, he asked him, so if I'm not allowed to do any of those things, what can I do? And um, then he asked him, can, um, do you smoke? Yes. You may continue. Do you drink alcohol? He said, yes. And then you may continue. And he um, continued a bit like that, um, uh, um, naming some of the uh, not so great qualities um, or habits of people. And then he's, and then um, he said, you can absolutely do all those things and still come here, but I cannot promise you that after you spend some time with us here, you will still have those, the need or the desire for those kind of um, habits. And so basically Guruji says, it's a transforming experience. You come, you join us in the ashram and all of those things, if you are really practicing meditation, they will fall away from you. Chris? Do you know what I loved about this story was the sweetness um, that kind of came across in, in hearing uh, her uh, re retell the story. And it kind of struck me at the time that <clears throat> um, I, I, don't, I don't have any bad experiences with, with uh, religious leaders, you know, meeting anybody that way, um, whether it be priests or monks um, or uh, ministers or anything. Um, but definitely the impression that I think Herb was sort of saying is there's a lot of negativity surrounding the the rules i think that's what he was sort of conveying like look this you know i'm only being told i shouldn't do stuff i'm not being told why or you know what why that might be the case and guruji really took that this this sweetness that, that real sweet element that i had in his heart and just said yeah you know you you can do these things but know that there's consequences and i think hearing that for me um really like that acknowledgement of um, your free will, you know, it's putting the decision making, you know, solely at, uh, with, with yourself um, and you're choosing to go down the spiritual path for the right reasons with full knowledge. And it kind of epitomizes what, you know, Yogananda kind of is to me in some way uh, and the SRF is to me in some way. I don't know if other people felt the same, but it's actually giving you the means of which to find to to control your own destiny of sorts to be self-realized to follow this path um not blindly um uh but uh, yeah with knowledge um and putting put that knowledge um uh to, to to you uh so so i thought this was a really great um uh bit to include in this documentary and just hearing it hearing the story being retold i felt like i was there as well so uh, yeah, I, I, I really, really enjoyed this um, little snippet. Absolutely, yeah. Priyank? Yeah, I enjoyed it too. I thought he said he said it with a lot of like honesty, and you can that can that came out on the screen, didn't it? And it was very funny. <laughs> His impression was very funny of, of how Guruji would speak with him, and it's uh, he in, instantly he endears you to him, doesn't he? And this is quite um, well done by the directors because late, they obviously would have filmed him speaking for, I don't know, an hour on various topics. And this was just one random story that he would have told. And they've made this the first, because he comes back and he comes in the film later on as well. But they made this the first introduction of this uh, person to the audience. And later on, he speaks like with a lot of emotion and gravity, and that wouldn't have the same <clears throat> impact had this endearing moment not been here. So I thought that was quite nice. nice. Um, and personally, 
let's get it let's get a little bit personal um in terms of uh you know things that drop away when you join the spiritual path i don't know about you guys but in one way or another i was basically herb jeffries <laughs> herb jeffries i think everyone um, was at some point right Mm. but i'll be interested to know what else like kind of not bad habits but like you know seemingly uh, qualities that uh, not qualities habits or like lifestyle choices that aren't aren't conducive to spiritual growth what ones you changed after cho- joining or like after taking ser- taking it seriously because there's a difference from when you when you join uh, you know and join become a lesson student and start you know meditating and stuff and there's a difference when then you take that um, you know that inward step and actually pledge your kind of life to it in in in, in a degree isn't that absolutely I, I think this is always the case you know when you are new on the path um, what you're not looking for is like um, some organization that tells you how bad you are it is more like you are looking for someone who actually loves you and love means that there is not not an artificial border or a boundary where you are on the outside and you have to work your way in it is more like you are in from the first day and you get inspired you know your soul gets awakened and you get inspired to become this better person that you want to that actually you want to be if you look inside and Hollywood is uh, produces all those kind of people that are so successful but they have problems with drugs and they they are unhappy and so there were a lot of interactions of that kind right uh, remember the stories of um, Elvis Presley visiting Diamata right and he was like she always said he was such a sweet soul right um, but he like he had all this fame and then it's really hard to to uh, turn turn all this energy into something positive or i remember um late brother turiananda at mount washington he would once a month receive a gang of bikers at mount washington and they would come once a month and they would um bring all their harley davidsons and park like 20 or 30 of them in front of Mount Washington headquarters, and then walk into Mother Center and ask for bro- Brother Turiananda. And then he would come down and, you know, Brother Turiananda, he was like this big guy. And he, he was like, um, there was always some banter going on when he was there. And he, they, they felt really understood by him. And so when, um, when, when he came down and, and he talked to them about God, they felt understood and they felt inspired. And so they came on a regular basis. And when brother passed away, they came one or two more times, but then they, they stopped coming because they had this special connection with him. And so I, I feel like this is, a, this is an important um, element. Priya? Yeah, brother Turin, and is that is he the one with the strong French accent, or am I thinking of someone? There were uh, multiple, but he, all, I think he, yeah, he also had a French. Yeah, he's got a really. There aren't many talks of him, if I recall, uh, recorded. But to the ones that there are, he's really, he's a very powerful, powerful. Must, um, I don't remember him seeing speaker. him live because it was a bit before my time. But he had some of the best quotes that yeah. I've heard. <laughs> yeah. Um, going back to the topic um, yeah. of um, you know things dropping away, I remember when I um, started and started taking it seriously. For me, it wasn't like gradual. I kind of just pretty much instantly changed. Like for example, I stopped drinking straight away. I stopped eating. I used to eat meat, um, and I stopped straight away. So like I did, I did these various like um, you know. Uh, things that uh, that seem drastic to like your friends and family um but I did them really like abruptly and this I think it's that it's not to do with like how you know my past life and what it might be but it's more to do with my weaknesses in the sense that I can't do things like in moderation I either do it or don't do it <laughs> don't do it like my wife's like um why do you do such extreme fasting I was like I can either fast or like I can just eat loads of food I you're, can't you're an engineer it can only be on or off right yeah I understand I, I can't do moderation yeah yeah Chris 
I'm, I'm the exact same. And when my, my wife met, met me, she thought I was this kind of, you know, quite extremist um, uh, character, you know, uh, talking about fasting and doing this and that. And, uh, you know, um, I, I, I you, think, you used yeah. to be part of Fight Club, didn't you, when you joined? When you what? met Barbara? Number, number, number one rule. <laughs> <laughs> so many young people would understand that joke at all. There's this yeah. movie called, yeah. is it called Fight Club, isn't it? With Graham. Yeah, it's called Fight Club, yeah. Um, Keanu Reeves. Keanu Reeves? No, it's someone Norton, no. isn't it? Ed Norton. Um, Ed Norton and Yeah, Brad not Pitt, yeah. Keanu Reeves. No? No, no, oh, no. Brad Pitt, Brad Pitt is in Brad it, right? Pitt, that's him, yeah. That's it. Oh, sorry, guys. Oh, yeah, no, okay. it's... Just, just to be yeah. clear, I, I wasn't in Fight Club. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I was the same, Priyank, to, to you. And I know we're going to talk about this in some more detail in the next minute. We're going to cover, you know, some of the reasoning behind this, but as to why, why it might be the case that you would see that drastic change. Um, for me, I, I did some intensive, you know, meditations over the course of, I think, you know, 48, 48 days. And I changed entirely, you know, and um, there was you know, a light switch that kind of just went on, as it were. Um, and, you know, I, as I said, we're going to talk about this a little bit more in the next minute about neuroplasticity and things like that. That's re a really interesting topic, um, which I think this is the reasoning behind it, um, uh, that the, the old habits were actually smoothed out in the, in the brain, in the grooves of the brain, it just kind of wipe them out uh, to, to a good degree. Um, but uh, I, I, guys, I wanted to actually mention like Sri, um, Sri Diamata's comments about like there is no evil, there's there's ignorance, there's like kind of shades of ignorance. Um, and Yogananda's uh, mention about raising children. And I think it, it's kind of like relevant here in some ways, like um, Yogananda was saying how much um, how much wrong or evil or ignorance in the world could be could be uh, fixed by better um, cultivating children um, and not scolding them when they do things wrong. So for in this in this instance, you know, you've got Herb sitting there quite innocently, as Prank, as you said, like asking him asking questions like, "Oh, I'm smoking, I'm you know, I'm boozing, I'm promiscuous. Uh, am, am I still welcome here?" And you're going to like, yeah, 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 of course you're welcome here. You know, he's not scolding him for, hey, you shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be doing that. He's, he's giving him this loving, um, uh, mother, mother, mothering love, uh, uh, almost as, as you put it there, Mike. You know, he's giving him unconditional love. And imagine if he had have turned around and kind of beat him over the head and said, stop doing what you're doing. So you're going to kind of practicing what he preaches in in many ways here by giving him that unconditional love um he talks about it in the lessons uh again i think i just read it recently um coincidentally um but yeah i just wanted to mention that like it, it's it's a great example isn't it of how he actually does practice what he preaches yeah mm. and it and it um made an imprint on his life so he like mm. i said he he uh, became 100 years old so he was barely at the half point of his life at the time when Guruji passed away. And he lived a spiritual, like, he, I mean, he, he had his career, obviously, but he uh, had a spiritual imprint, a spiritual inclination for the rest of his life. I read his, um, there was an obituary on the UCLA website, and it, and it said there he was a student of Yogananda, a lifelong student of Yogananda. So that was... Great. So if I ever, if there's ever an obituary written about me, I wanted to say that too. That's, that is like quality mark for a lifetime, I would say. Nice. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So um, one more thing is like, there's a famous story that um, involves Sir Jeffries as well. And it's <clears throat> about him um, uh, thinking uh, that uh, Guruji should do some magic tricks for him <laughs> when he first met him. And uh, Guruji picks up on that. Um, should we read that card? Priyan, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. So, I was once sitting with Yoganandaji in his room at Mount Washington at Self-Realization Fellowship Headquarters. He had a beautiful view of the distant hills and mountains. Guruji was often, sorry, Guruji was talking to me in his wonderful, kind voice. I was sitting on the floor, listening to him. I had been with him for a year by then 
And so I started thinking, I've been here for a year. Why don't you do something miraculous like walking across the swimming pool? <laughs> Suddenly, Yogananda responded to my mental question. He said, ah, what do you want me to do, boy? A 10 cent store trick? <laughs> <laughs> it's already how he picks up just on your thoughts, right? It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Chris, do you want to continue? Yes. He continued, suppose I take this incense burner and I take away and I take my hand away. You'll see this thing levitating before you. This is a miraculous thing. No, we don't want to do a 10 cent store trick. Suppose I take this table. It's a larger object, therefore a greater phenomenon. And we, and we don't want to do a 10 cent, 10 cent store trick. Suppose we take this room we are sitting in and let it rise in an elevator. It's a larger object and therefore a greater phenomenon. Ah, we don't want those 10 cent store tricks. Or, and then he continues, uh, look out the window and see that mountain. Suppose I take this mountain, lifting up this mountain and let it rise up into the air from the horizon. It's a greater object and therefore a great, great, great phenomenon. Uh, we don't do 10 cent store tricks. Now let's suppose we take this planet Earth 25,000 miles in circumference and I make it levitate in the firmament, no strings to hold it up levitating. You see what I mean, boy? Why then do you want me to do a 10 cent store trick with an incense burner? <laughs> uh, and it's such, a, such an interesting story because it's really, we live in this, life and we take it all for granted because we see it every day but it's all it's all god's miracle that we that we live in here right and um i i think the other the other thing is that he already performed a miracle in my mind by just reading his thoughts there right just by just imagine you sit there with your guru and you think something something and then he just picks up on your thoughts like that that reminds me so much of Sri Yukteswar and Guruji together, right? When they have their stories, like the one on the mosquito consciousness, or there's so so many so many examples of it. And I'm I'm sure one of the reasons why Herb Jeffries shared that story is because he felt so blessed being able to have a story like this with Guruji. And I'm sure they must have had a a connection from a previous life or something like that to to be able to um, work this. Uh, show such a great example of a uh, um, disciple guru relationship. Uh, Priyank? Yeah, I found it cool. The one of the example miracle examples he used was um, taking this mountain and lifting it up and rising up in the air. Because I'm sure you'll remember the young, the boy Krishna did that in his adolescence mm, yeah. mm -hmm. to save mm -hmm. his um, yeah. to save his village family from the drowning, uh, you know, from the waters and rainers with his uh, little finger. So, uh, yeah, hence we call of uh, Govardhan because he lifted the Govardhan mountain. Yeah. And, yeah, I, I guess the, the, the willingness to do miracles is very high in the Bhagavad Gita some, for some reason. Um, but it was also a different time back then, I guess, when people's minds were less like, I, f I feel like back then those kind of things were maybe not as spectacular in the context of things because there were so many gods everywhere that performed um, big miracles. And also the, um, um, like the performance of miracles to convert a disciple is almost like negating his like free will, isn't it, in a sense? Mm -hmm. But so back then, like, the story of Krishna or the people that were close to him, i.e. his his you know friends and family, they weren't just regular, you know, Joes. They were probably quite advanced disciples right. of Krishna already that are already disciples. So him showing them a miracle is uh, is not like uh, you know, now you follow me, because they were already following him. Um but <laughs> If someone, were, you know, if, if Guruji was here with us and, and back then obviously he was there and he started showing everyone miracles, then people would obviously start following him because, you know, now it's plain it's in plain sight that divinity is manifesting before you. So there's no like, um, you know, you, you kind of like, that's not the way 
um, this creation is is working, isn't it? In terms of the, the the divine plan is for you to, through your own free will, to go towards that um, that path. And so similarly, like you know, in Krishna's days, um, everyone everyone heard about his glory. They had to then believe or disbelieve and then choose to follow or not follow follow only his like very close disciples actually saw these things the rest heard about it so there's there's, there's, there's the nuanced difference and then, so then the rest of you know india had you know they heard about the glories of krishna but they didn't you know they, they, they were then it's within their gift whether or not they followed him or not uh, hmm. yeah, that, that makes sense but at the same time, I keep wondering about this. There, there's oftentimes it's being said that our world is suffering from ignorance of God, right? That we we have so such a strong inclination in the Western world for atheism, and that and then there's all kinds of reasons why people don't believe in God. And I was I'm sometimes wondering, wouldn't like if we have some saints coming up doing some miracles, wouldn't that change that? Um, wouldn't that make it make it different in people's lives um, showing people that God is important and God is real and a lot of things bad things that happen to us is because we don't turn to him but there so, would th then there would be no play <laughs> the play would be over yeah, yeah. <laughs> the not, yeah. There'd, be, there'd be no Chiara Sciuro, would there? <laughs> <laughs> maybe I, I I was I would like you, you know I, you you read sometimes what Sri Yukteswar writes in the Holy Science that you will have a society that will be there as a society, the goal will be to find God and you are born and you're being taught about it and you're being put on a path and you know, and I don't see any of this right now. The, so the, I, he's talking about the Satya Yoga, right? The highest in the highest age where it will be predominant. But even in the Satya Yoga, I'm sure there's people that are mired in delusion as well, but obviously there might be the minority. Yeah, but even even before the Satya Yuga, he talks about a world civilization that is that is like looking for for God essentially, and um, I don't think it means that they all find him. I, I wish everyone would just be on somewhere on on this kind of like moving in the right direction, but maybe that's, that's too <laughs> much for our time right now. Too much of an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, Chris. We're in the time we, we we need to figure out through reason. I think it's it's like trying to wrap our minds around the new, um, you know, the the, the new uh, uh, terms that you know, electricity and um, you know we're splitting the atom and think these things. We we need to understand the science behind it, right? Um, so maybe maybe that's like a phase that humanity needs to go through before it can actually accept. The, the more ridiculous phenomenons that go on in in uh, in life but th there's the guy um just popped into my head um a guru uh, i think he passed in india that he was manifesting like jewelry um Sat satya sai baba isn't that's him yeah yeah he's he's really well known for that isn't he uh, he would kind of go around and do something with his hand and he would just be handed out jewelry to everybody that he would, you know, to people that would pass. That's like very, very different to what, you know, Yogananda and Sri Yukteswar and people would talk about, um, you know, don't manifest your powers in, in, in front of people. This is in plain sight and there's video, video footage of it, whether it's real or not. I, I don't know what you guys think, but I was very skeptical when I saw that. So, um, yeah, I was also skeptical about him. I mean, I don't know. I I don't have any 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 real knowledge about it, but I I read a lot of uh, of people said that he was like I don't know, maybe not for real. What do you think, Brian? Um, <clears throat> I saw that one very famous video where he like regurgitated like a gold egg. <laughs> Really? Did you, do you see that? It was really funny, and it looked so silly because. <laughs> Oh, I haven't met him. It, yeah. I haven't. I haven't met him. Or well, I didn't like. You know, so I don't. But people that have met him and have been in his presence have sworn to the experience. But on the video, it just looks 
horrific. It just looks so silly. Um, if you if you, if you watch that video, you can clearly see that um, he's basically swallowed this thing and then he's just regurgitating it. This huge freaking gold egg yeah. that he's regurgitating. It looks miraculous, but it looks silly as well. Um, so yeah, so I get this because back to the whole Krishna thing, right? So people were there, they saw it and you know they were they didn't need to believe, they saw it with their own eyes. The rest have to uh, choose whether or not to go down that path. Yeah. yeah imagine, oh yeah. imagine your friends with Lahiri Mahashai, where he just came back from the mountain and then he makes Babaji appear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then, and then Babaji tells him off, right, pretty much. Yeah, he does. Yeah, so which, which shows you, like, which kind of might kind of answers your previous uh, <laughs> like you know pondering that you had about why don't you know how, how good would it be if they just showed showed yeah. you right he, he tells him i will always appear when you call for me and then he was like now i will only appear yeah. if you need me exactly right because <laughs> because a lot of people are they, they just care about i they're just idle curious idle curiosity seekers they're not like mm -hmm. seekers right so like if they saw a miracle they'll be, and then they just be like oh that's a miracle cool that guy performs miracles that's just what he does. And then they'll just, pitch, they'll just box that into a thing and then just move, carry on with their lives and trivial, trivialize the most you know, divine aspect of, of a saint or a master. Yeah, I think you're right. Like I, those people that saw Bab that, that Lahiri Mahasaya showed to Babashi, do you think they then became <laughs> lifetime disciples? Maybe. Uh, you don't know, right? <laughs> yeah, but do you, do you think they did? Because then Babaji would not have then reprimanded Lady Marsha, because he was clearly saying they were just they were just having a banter conversation pretty much and then Lady Marsha made him made Babaji appear true I mean <clears throat> it is hard for me to believe that Babaji appears to you and it doesn't make a spiritual impact on your no, life no Mike I, it's not hard for me to believe at all because I've seen like grace that's defense like that's like been upon my friends and family and yet they still do not choose to go down that path that their graces come from. So mm. it's not like, it's not, it's not so clear that, oh, you, you see it and you experience it. So then you, you life change and you go in that direction. I've seen with my own eyes that that's not what happens with like humanity. They, they just, they're too like, well, no, you know, in, in my opinion, sometimes they're too like engrossed and it's quite hard. There's too much inertia to change the course or the direction that you should follow even even though you've just experienced something so divine and like and i think it, it's probably also some sort of fear in that as well they don't want to let go of like things that they've just pretty much invested their whole life and their whole being into all their energies i don't know conjecture but chris i i have a little take on this i think you know we're we're gods with a small g in a sense you know we we have a great ability to manifest our realities and so you kind of see what you want to see you know your 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 programming is, is there to allow you to experience life as you will it to be so if you're if you have this will to be to live in ignorance i don't I don't think uh, it's it's necessarily God's will then to the you of that ignorance against your against your will. If that makes sense, so so it's it's up to you to then choose. You have to choose it. Otherwise, you know you can take the horse to the water, but you can't make a drink. But I think I think it's to do with the will power. It's quite strong. Yeah, that's my take. Maybe. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Should we leave it at that? That was um um summarizes the minute pretty well so we have talked about um guruji turning the community into more of a monastic life and we talked about herb jeffries and how he is was a celebrity turned disciple and um followed it for uh, the length of his life um Priyank, any last thoughts last thoughts maybe some deeper thoughts um we glossed over the the vows a little bit um so the vows that they mentioned in the minute were simplicity celibacy obedience and loyalty um interestingly <laughs> those aren't necessarily 
vows that only monks need to take. So simplicity is something that we can all aspire to in our lives, you know, having having minimalistic lives, you know, low amount of material indulgence um, and and all sorts of, you know, pleasure seeking and thrill seeking is 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 not in keeping with that kind of vow that you might take as to lead a simple life. <clears throat> I don't know what your thoughts on that are, but celibacy is an interesting one because, you know, this moderation thing comes in again and, you know, acting promiscuously or abusing that sex force is, is part of that. So even though, you know, when you're, when you're married or in, in, not in the monastic uh, life, you may not practice celibacy, but you can still practice the um what's it so some of the philosophy behind it in terms of moderation and not in overindulging and um it, you know in, in the scripture it even goes to the furthest extent of like you would only choose not to be celibate when you have the intention or the desire to have a child so if we look at for example the um the life of uh, bhagavati charangosh or the yeah. you know guruji's father that they would only come together, and I'm quoting, mm -hmm. you know, the autobiography of Yogi as, as as husband and wife once or year or or however often they needed they wanted to actually have a child. So other than that, it would be a celibate life, and that's obviously quite a challenging challenging um, aspiration to to like subscribe to. But I think it's it's obviously very closely and intricately linked to where we want to raise our awareness and our energies from uh, the lowest lower chakras to the to the higher chakras and transmuting that sex force or that kundalini into uh, you know for a, a greater or better purpose so that's celibacy so i think that equally applies to us as well who aren't monastics obedience is a interesting one as well isn't it because guruji is basically he's given us a guide of like how to live pretty much in terms of virtually every walk of life if you if you if you look it's there not just in terms of you know practices and sadhana but actually how you interact with people in business how you interact with your family so you know that 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 obedience thing is certainly there as well and loyalty well loyalty is um is is, is pretty clear and does it doesn't matter if you're if you're um if you're a monk or not, loyalty is something that we need to all practice in terms of the to, to loyalty to your sadhana, loyalty to your, to your guru and your, you know, and the vows that you've taken, either the Kriya, the Kriya pledge, if you're, if you're a Kriya band in terms of practicing Kriya regularly and faithfully. Um, yeah, so I thought that that, that was a good thing that uh, they, they added those four words in there, but actually they're quite poignant and relevant for all of us not just monastics mm -hmm. uh, chris i was going to come back to this as well um uh, i find you know some material online i thought was really really nice but there was a small quote here on loyalty from paramahansa yogananda saying loyalty is the highest law and it is equality that makes possible the depth of commitment and purity of heart that are necessary if one would know god um, and that first you pledge your loyalty to God, then the, the guru and the gurus of self-realization fellowship, the president of self-realization fellowship, and so on. But I thought that was that was lovely. Loyalty is the highest law. It's, it's such a that's a that's a pretty deep statement right there, from what I could see. Because yeah, you wouldn't because you wouldn't think loyalty would be the highest law, would you? Yeah. You just think it's just one of those stepping stone things. But if you there's a there's probably one of I'd say the top three uh, SRF talks uh, by Brother Anandamoy on this topic. It's called Loyalty: The Highest Spiritual Law, and he literally talks about this and what it means in the Guru Disciple relationship for over an hour, and it is profound. I'd highly recommend you guys uh watch that or li listen to that one on um on the audio things from the yogananda.org website maybe we could put that link in yeah. the description yeah. i'll do that i'll do that so people can, can jump in. <clears throat> there was another quote yogananda said here the greatest romance that you can have 
is the romance with God. He is the lover and our souls are the beloved. And when the soul meets the greatest lover of the universe, then the eternal romance begins. The love that you have been asking, seeking for incarnations through all human loves is at last yours. You will never want anything else. That's a, a quote to go with the celibacy. <laughs> There you go. But uh, nothing more for me. Uh, I like what you said about loyalty there, Chris. And, and I feel like it ties in with the, the Herb Jeffrey story with you can, can I keep drinking? Can I keep smoking? Mm -hmm. You can do all those things because you start with the loyalty to the guru and the other qualities they manifest one by one, I'm guessing as well. As, as you spend time in this higher vibration but the loyalty is something you must have because otherwise you will just quit and not come again and then it will be just a limited amount of mm -hmm. of um uh change that will happen in your life but if you stick with it then eventually you will um succeed in your goal to be free freedom yes freedom Free right. at last. Yes. <laughs> that would be good to quote the uh, Samadhi poem. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> knowing, which we, which we've all known. known. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> As one, which we've all memorized, of course, in our various <laughs> books. All right. Okay. Um, thank, thank you, guys. That was minute 51. 55. Is it 55? Oh, 55. That's right. All right. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Take care.